Dave, welcome to the show. How are you today? Mike, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Beautiful day out here in the Northeast. Excellent. It's a beautiful day here in the Midwest as well. So uh, I hope that's a good sign that we're going to have a, an excellent talk. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while and I really appreciate uh, all the time. So um, part of part of my ethos is trying to get like the backstory, right? Um, and as I was talking with you before we started, I said, I'm a guy that really I feel like I never really had a calling. I didn't have like a plan in place necessarily for how my career was going to go. So my first question is like, when you were in college, what did you want to do with your life? Yeah, it's a good question. My, um, my first thought was I wanted to own my own business, you okay. know, and then it's funny to say that with that only being true for the last 18 months and not being true for the 20 years prior. Um, but, but literally when I left, it was 1999. It was just before the dot-com boom. And my thinking was, I'll go, I was an engineer but I wasn't the engineer. It was electrical engineering. I wasn't the engineer like on the circuit board, like in our project groups, I was the one who presented. So I'm like, great, I'll go, I'll go consulting. I'll see a bunch of businesses. I'll pick up some skills for two or three years and then I'll be ready to have my own business. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that then turned into another gig and another project and then another company, you know, promotions and golden handcuffs get tighter. And then all of a sudden I looked up in 20 years and was like, I had, that, that company I was going to start when I was 22 still hasn't been started. Um, you know, and that probably the, if you were to ask me like, why, you know, it's, um, I've reflected on it a lot. Like I had a pretty like scarcity mindset, you know, we grew up relatively, um, kind of lower middle class for most of my childhood. It sort of felt like we were, you know, there were arguments about money. So like this idea of, for me, it was always like, well, could I save a little bit more? Could I have a little bit bigger cushion, a little longer runway, a little better safety net? Um, and, you know, when time came to like rotate out of my next gig at Bridgewater, because we rotated a lot, um, you know, there was a question of like, well, if not now, when, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and that sort of started on the, the latest chapter, which I know we'll get to a little bit later. So I, uh... Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just thinking, okay, so you had the engineering background. Was that kind of born out of that mindset? Maybe like a uh, STEM jobs, a good job. Like there's, there's people that pay for that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. Like I was actually invited into the English honors program. Like a, I was a pretty decent writer, even okay. in high school. And, um, but you know, I just sort of thought like, well, I can do that on the side, but I should learn engineering. I should learn something that's going to be valued in the future. I should do something that's hard, you know, uh, it certainly lived up to that, you know, barely, barely scraping by to like knock on the door of a 3.0 of that degree. Um, but then I also was a TA over in the business school for accounting and I continued to, you know, do the English stuff on the side. So there was, there was certainly a, um, yeah, it was more defense than offense. Okay, so kind of post college and out in the real world, first job or at least first uh, major, you know, career was not really in engineering as well. How, what take take us a little bit through your your history, maybe up to Bridgewater, and I kind of want to ask some follow up questions when you get there. Sure. So um, I started at PwC back when they had a technology consulting division, uh, which eventually I think got sold to IBM. Uh, I managed to pull down that job despite my GPA through meeting an alumni of our fraternity. Like a guy came back to recruit. He needed a place to crash. He crashed on my couch. We hit it off. He slipped me into a open interview slot on campus the next day and, uh, you know, kind of advocated for me. And I got that gig and did that for a couple of years. Uh, much like many consultants being on the road 50 weeks a year is a pretty much a grind. And so, uh, got an opportunity to work at Columbia on a project, the university. Did that for about nine months. That was a pretty quick gig. Um, we could detour on why I left there, but the short version of it was I had a vacation planned with my good friends and my future wife, and they told me I couldn't take it, and I told them I could. Um, and 48 hours later, I had a job at Moody's making about 60% more than I was making at Columbia, so it was, ended up being a win-win. Uh, stayed there for nine years, got an MBA in the middle, which they paid for. Um, I don't know that I would have done it, but there was no, no strings attached. And I got like a top 10 MBA from NYU. Uh, and then, you know, I can get us to Bridgewater. The, the, quick, the quick story that gives the entry to Bridgewater is um, a recruiter called one of my direct reports 
And uh, he's, he cleverly said, you know, I'm not really looking, but did you say the job's in Connecticut? Because my boss lives in Connecticut. Uh, and my phone rang that Friday. And it just so happened to be, you know, summer up here, like August, I think it's like probably June or so, super hot. And the train broke down three different days. So my hour commute from Connecticut down to uh, lower Manhattan turned into a two hour commute each way. And, you know, the third one breaks down, you get to the office, it's like sweaty, hot mess. And the phone rings, you're like, I don't know this number, but I kind of picked it up. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another. And I said, well, sure, let's talk. Nine minute commute sounds better than a two hour one. So that's the, that's the quick, the quick timeline. I want to, I want to ask a follow-up question. Uh, Cause like you just glanced over it, but you said uh, between PwC and Moody's, there was like 48 hours and you had a new job. Like, take me through that because a lot of our audience is, you know, job hunting and wondering how something like that happens. Uh, is that network? Is that, how, how did that come about? Uh, it was honestly recruiters. I call, I, I was somewhere between um, ticked off and annoyed. <laughs> and so, you know, before I threw a stink, I sort of reached out to a couple of recruiters just so I could understand you know, what is the world like? Like it was post.com crash, right? It was 2002, you know, so the market wasn't booming, but it was definitely bouncing back. And I had an engineering degree. I had worked at a big four consulting firm. And in the process of doing that in the project, I have, you know, been attached to some pretty good software. Like I had done people soft implementations, had done, um, you know, different analytics software. I could write SQL you know, not like um, earth shattering things, but like tangible skills. Mm -hmm. And they were, uh, turns out that one of the two had an opening at Moody's that they had been struggling to fill that had kind of like that three year experience mark with someone who was technical enough to write code, but, um, you know, polished enough to oversee a few analysts. And uh, they rushed me, you know, they were like, can you go meet with the hiring manager tomorrow? And so we met met with him and he said, stick around and introduced me to his boss, met with two of the team. And they're like, great, we'll have an offer for you tomorrow. It sort of, it happened real fast. Wow. Um, and it was, there was, you know, in hindsight, I should have negotiated. I didn't even negotiate because it was so much better than what I was currently making. And they solved an immediate problem for me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, again, I, I mean, I have a lot of experience with recruiters now post that time. Sure. And so I would say like, if you are, if you have tangible valued skills in the market, um, at a minimum, you sort of want to stay in touch with a couple of recruiters because they will have a lot of the information and intel. Uh, but in many cases, like they get the first look at jobs. You know, unless you had a backdoor into an organization where the literal team you sort of found it before it was published or posted, a lot of these companies don't go through that hassle. They just sort of outsource it and let the recruiters do it. Interesting. Um, you see. It, it, the recruiters and like what's going on right now today with the job market, you know, a lot of people talk about how we're, we're essentially short jobs and there's a war for talent. Is that accelerated since that time period? Oh yeah. Like it was, um, again, this was sort of post.com boom. So we were turning or bust, I would say, but we were turning, but we weren't, uh, we certainly weren't out of it. And so that idea that, um, kind of play that forward with all the liquidity that's been flowing through the market over the last kind of couple cycles, especially the last five years. Um, I know last stats I saw, we were probably two, two jobs for every one unemployed person. Now, I'm sure that some of that is temp tempering a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think people should stare at the headlines right now of, um, you know, kind of high rising, high risk unicorns, you know, doing 20 or 30% layoffs. Like, I think that's a bit built in structurally. Uh, and even if you have giants like Amazon or others sort of slowing hiring, you still have that entire imbalance to work through. So I think it, it now more than ever, um, you know, you still have an opportunity to be in the driver's seat as, a, as the employee versus the company. Interesting. All right. So uh, like a big part of your story here is, is kind of your time at Bridgewater. Uh, Bridgewater is famous in, in circles around me. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, I started my career as a prop futures trader. So I have, have a little, um, you know, markets experience, but for our audience who maybe doesn't know Bridgewater, can you, can you talk a little bit about what that company does, um, their hedge fund and kind of maybe like why they are sort of unique and held out at a, is, as a model, or at least an example of, um, how, how companies can build teams. Yeah. So I think the, 
the short, short version is like, this is the world's largest hedge fund that's been around for 40 plus years. The, you know, that, that sort of equates to, we were managing, you know, the number fluctuates, but call it $160 billion for the most sophisticated investors in the world, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, et cetera. And then the, to your point model, right? There's different types of models. There'll be funds that are algorithmic, right? They're just, they're computers that do all the trading. A lot of times they're high frequency. They're trying to just like outrun the rest of the market to produce excess returns. Um, Bridgewater was much more like a, it's a, it's a macro hedge fund. So we're looking at big, broad trends. And then we would do that systematically, right? So we do very in-depth research. Um, we try to re- figure out like the universal principles of markets and then use that to inform our decisions that the, the people in charge of investing then make. So it's not algorithmic in that computers are doing all the work, uh, but it is certainly systematic in that the, the lessons learned over 40 years keep getting compounded. Yeah, and I would say, um, again, trying to make these multi-billion dollar decisions in highly uncertain environments, right? All always changing. I would say like money management and hedge funds are kind of always at the forefront of, of essentially trying to systematize good decisions. Mm-hmm. And then as part of that, I think what I've learned from, from Bridgewater and the founder Ray Dalio and reading his books and, and all that kind of stuff is just as a part of that, it's like really systemize, systematizing um, human resources and people uh, that uh, make those decisions or aid, aid uh, computers in making decisions. Um, so like, I, I mean, it, in, in your, your role within that was, a, was very much developing or recruiting uh, the people side and creating some of the management, uh, I guess, uh, evaluation and, and, and processes around making the people as best as they can. Can you, can you talk a little bit about your role there? Yeah. Well, let me, um, one quick tangent, because you said that it's about, um, you know, the idea of like systemizing good decisions. Uh, And I think that's right. But one thing that I thought was interesting that I saw walking into Bridgewater, uh, in terms of me doing my research on whether I wanted to go work there, and it seems like it's likely playing out again, is arguably the real innovation is systemizing not making bad decisions. Like if you were to look at the chart of their returns over time, in a lot of the up years in the market, Bridgewater, um, just comparing you say, you know, to the equity index or whatever, would underperform. Not, ma- not massively, but in those years, the market might be up 12 or 15%. Bridgewater might only be up six or eight. But, but the kind of the leap years are the years the market tanks, right? It's the 2008s when everybody else is down 60% and they've, cr- they've looked at the system through a much longer horizon to kind of have bets in place that when that happens, for very, you know, for very little money, they can make big returns. And so like years that the market's down 60, they're up 40. And so that spread is massive, right? So to some degree, it's not systemizing thousands of little good ideas. It's, it's really systemizing not breaking when everyone else breaks, you know, and that also gives you the secondary benefit of being a hedge, right? Being not correlated to the rest of the market. Um, sorry, it's a bit of a detour, but it's just, um, it's an interesting phenomenon because you can sort of zoom out and see their total results, but realize that um, it's really five or six massive years that, that drive that. And it's yeah. the years when everyone else is going the wrong way. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I, reading like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, I mean, same type of thing. They, they're always talking about, we're just, we're just trying to not be dumb, basically, and wait and take the fat pitch when it comes and, and what you know. And there, there's so much that you can kind of, if you take that to a, from a career perspective or, um, you know, applying it to just your individual, the individual things that you pursue or put your, your time um, behind the idea that like kind of minimizing decisions or just saying like that, that's not, that's something I want to avoid kind of narrows your, your focus set. And mm-hmm. you can kind of compound that forward um, just in your individual decisions, which so I, I love, I love the idea of like kind of listening to, these really smart money managers and, and how they think about the world and what they're, what they try to do. And then I trying to channel that into like how I do things just in my own personal life. I, I think that's like yeah. one of the, one of the biggest things I've learned from like reading all these books and following some of these guys. So that's. Well, I think it's a perfect transition into your question. 
uh, in terms of my role, but also yeah. like the role of um, this approach, right? Like, I think what's really perhaps the most profound piece is, um, you know, it's almost like the two parts of your brain are always battling, right? The lizard brain, which was all about fight or flight, you know, and then like the more intellectual side. And I think partly what all of these guys have done is they have through whatever means necessary, either it's a tremendous discipline or in the case of Bridgewater, I think it's really through systemization. They're saying like, let me somehow get out of the lizard brain and stay in the like, you know, fact data driven logical brain. Uh, because I think a lot of us, I mean, we're all watching the market swing around and like, I know better and still have a lot of the same instincts, right? Like, oh, it's falling. I should sell, you yeah. know? And actually what it would tell you if, if you're really having a dislocation, you should probably be buying, right? And, but it's like so hard because you got to get past that first, you know, instinctual part of your brain to get there versus if you just have a system that can make that decision dispassionately uh, and give you that recommendation, then you can sort of get past that. Um, seems like, you know, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger did that through discipline. They're just like exceed, exceedingly patient and disciplined. And that's like another path to the same place. And so, um, like I said, my roles were very much, I had, uh, I was a COO of a couple of different departments. I worked in the talent function for a while, running executive recruiting. We did stuff on succession and development. Um, if you sort of think of any company or any team as like the combination of a design, right? Like process and technology, and then the people to do it. Um, that same system was sort of how Bridgewater thought of it. So your, your process and your technology, right? There was that system for trading. The process was very much, you know, the investor, either you're, you're either working with the clients who manage their money and connect it to our, our strategies, or you were doing the research to figure out like how that system worked. And everyone else really was like organizing the people, right? So even as a COO, it was, you know, everything from like, how do people develop and do we have the right talent down to, where do they sit and how do they collaborate? And so um, really in all my jobs, it was very much focused on that side of the equation. Okay. And so I want to kind of get into a little bit of how that was done. I mean, because Bridgewater is, is kind of famous for some interesting uh, tools and, and it's really a lot, a lot around, um, I think one, learning, learning from history and having like a lot of, a, a lot of, um, data points along the way uh, so yeah. that you can kind of your traits or, or your out, the, the decisions that you make are out, and outcomes can be measured against uh, historical data sets um, and that and taking that from the investment side and applying it to people. Mm -hmm. um, but it sort of really starts with kind of Ray Dalio, the founder's uh, principles and, and his idea that he that he basically took over his life has, has codified principles over time, written them down, organized them in a framework and in a system for making better decisions, which he, I read as a PDF, uh, I think I told you in like 2010. And now, you know, I've got this book on my shelf right here. Um, and it was kind of his operating system, if you will. Um, and then it's gone from that to actually quantifiable tools for measuring performance and getting feedback that are a little bit maybe uh, out there for most people. Can you, can you maybe kind of go into this a little bit? Yeah. So um, the history, as I understand it, is, you know, Ray starts in his two bedroom apartment, you know, then starts making these trades. And part of what made his approach different was for every trade he made before he made it, he basically wrote down, you know, this is the trade and this is what I expect to happen. And then he'd make the trade and see what actually happened. So then he would compare that outcome to his projected outcome. And if they aligned, great, he had learned something. If they didn't align, then he would try to diagnose, well, what was, that, what was wrong? Like, why did I have that incorrect? And then he would use that understanding to kind of then make a better trade and make the same bet, you know, make a new bet and go through that same process over and over. So there was this compounding of that through time. And then I think as he started to, you know, he'll talk about his transition or kind of his three phases of life. As he started to think about, well, how am I going to transition out of leading Bridgewater and let the next generation of leaders do that? Um, those same, if, if you could use that same compounding to understand something as complicated as global financial markets, what he started to see is you could probably do roughly the same thing to manage people. Like at some level, it might even be slightly easier because it's a smaller market to understand. 
Um, we have a tendency to be slightly irrational and fickle as human beings, but that same concept of, um, you know, he would talk a lot about everything being another one of those. Like as much as we all feel like we're all snowflakes and deeply original and you know, whatever else, the patterns reemerge, right? We all struggle with similar work things like giving feedback. We all, you know, different companies could be, you know, victim of groupthink. Like you'll, you'll sort of see the same things happen over and over. Some stars will have underconfidence and some mediocre players will have overconfidence. And so you could over time sort of build a catalog of what are all of these sort of management moments that are going to happen? And then what are the principles that should guide you through them so that it's not lizard brain reacting, it's that same system and compounding happening. Um, and so the, like you said, that really started with him writing down, like, I think at the time it was a couple hundred principles. You know, he then sort of like worked with the organization to say like, you know, what's missing? What do we add in? How do we start compounding the system? Um, that then led to, I think, a couple more iterations, ultimately the book kind of maybe five years ago, which I think has more on the order of 400 of them. So you can see that it evolved and grew and more people contributed to it. Um, and then part of that was to say that, okay, that system gives you sort of the blueprint, but then you have to operationalize it, right? In the same way that we would build investing systems, you still needed to actually make trades. And so in the same way, you know, we had to manage day to day on the ground. And so we took some of those most challenging moments and he started like experiment with building little tools. And so, um, you know, one that he made public was the dot collector, right? So it was effectively a pretty simple app where, you know, anybody at any moment could give someone feedback across 60 dimensions. So I could say like, wow, like the, the preparation for this podcast, Mike, um, really analytical. I give you an eight on that. I see some really, you know, creative questions, give you a nine on that. Um, and, you know, but you missed a lot of details about how Bridgewater works. So I give you a four on that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, making that up. So <laughs> then, um, and you, it's like, okay, so now I've communicated to you my point of view. We could transact on it or we couldn't. Like I was, you know, typical years, I'd probably get 3000 observations from different people. Um, but those things would accumulate up into patterns. Like the, um, you know, I think he's talked a lot in a couple of TED talks about like this concept of a baseball card. So instead of any individual like hit, you know, that a, um, a baseball player gets, you sort of roll that up and say like, well, how on average, how often do they get hits? What's their on base percentage? How many RBIs do they have? That same sort of thing would happen for us. All those observations would roll up and say, oh, Dave's pretty good at synthesizing complicated issues. And Dave's a pretty logical problem solver. Dave, uh, you yeah, know, so so on detail orientation and being organized. You know, and so that really helps you when you start to think about teaming and solving problems. Like, okay, like this thing requires really in-depth detail orientation. We're probably not going to put Dave on that, you know, but it's a really complicated, you know, tangled mess that something needs to be like clarified. Like, great, let's bring him in and have him do that. And so that's sort of how you could trend, you know, go from like a big system of these principles to then getting the data and then using that to actually operate. Um, instead of just sort of being, that's how it goes from being like a slogan, you know, like we all see those motivational posters down to, you know, the actual way we operated um, on the ground. And so just a couple things to point out for the audience. I mean, as you describe that, I think the key, the key thing to understand about this system is that it, it was in real time, as I understand it, correct? I mean, you could be sitting in a, in a room, or I should say it was, it is, because it's still being used. You could sit, you could be sitting in a room with uh, 10 people and on the screen, <laughs> you would literally see like dots and observations um, being logged for participants in the meeting. So this, this is one of those things where, you know, a lot of companies may give you ratings once a year, you know, in, in, a, in, a, um, in an evaluation uh, right before a bonus or something like that, just end of the year. And that, that's, that's one that's kind of one observation. This was, this is continuous and going on all the time. So there was this, there's this transparency around it, which is uncomfortable. And I want to ask you a little bit about that as well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the key benefit is the, uh, this is happening with everybody. There's a very big incentive to be truthful and just get it out there. And then you have this sort of massive data set, and then you can compare objectively to the rest of people in the in the company, right? And have kind of like this base rate. So, and, and that's that's really um, important with feedback. I was just on um, a Startup Hustle podcast this morning and we were having this conversation about, about kind of closing the loop on feedback. And I was I was thinking about what our conversation was gonna be upcoming. And, and it's really like, I think a lot of times 
employees, it, it, it's, it's that comparison to a base rate um, that is missing for them to understand like, ob oh, objectively, maybe I'm not quite as good as I think I am at this particular thing, or I could learn X, Y, and Z to be become better. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want me, if you want to click into the feedback one, it's, it's super complicated and I'm personally torn up. So I, I can start to deviate from what I experienced to kind of my own point of view a bit. But, um, you know, if you go into, so yes, you're right. It was all, it was real time. Like you could do it in any meeting. It was very conservative of you to say it was a 10 person meeting. Cause a lot of times we prioritize, um, as part of Ray's transition, like he'd like to use meetings as teaching moments. And so often you might have 50 or hundred people invited to a meeting, all who had an iPad who could give you observations. And so, you know, occasionally you'd have some glory and get 80 people praising your creativity. Uh, and many other times they would be very quick to point out how much you might've flubbed a presentation or, uh, you know, had a narrow point of view or been missing the big, big picture. Um, so it's real time. It's also like a Twitter feed. So you can see anyone's in the company all the time. So, um, you know what I mean? It's, it is, um, this is where it gets some, some of the catch 22 of it, which, yeah. you know, again, it was like anything, it's like an evolving system. Um, so one is when you have 3000 observations, a lot of people want to legislate every observation. So all of a sudden we get from a world of, hey, don't worry about any particular dot, just zoom out and see the patterns, but people, it's still feedback, right? And it can even feel anonymous, right? We see this, the, the behavior in a lot of organizations, you know, all of a sudden it starts to feel like social media. Like I'm not saying it to you, Mike, I'm writing it into an app. And for whatever reason, I can sort of lower inhibitions um, mm -hmm. or let people be a little bit sharper than they might be. Um, and at Bridgewater, that was sort of built into the culture. Like that was okay. We had all signed up for that. But when you start to think about that in the broader world, like right. that gets hard. Like not all organizations have actually signed up for that. So you get this, you can get this um, like tax, right? And the problem with the tax then is it's sort of like, well, if I'm going to get legislated every time I give a piece of feedback, I'm going to stop giving feedback. And all of a sudden the system starts to fall. So you have that piece. There's also, um, I guess, two other things that came to mind. One, um, one is that the there's a pretty heavy bias skew in most organizations, negative versus positive. Like we we tend to like sort of accept the things that are good as sort of like table stakes, but then hone in on like the one thing that was wrong. So it can skew very negative. Um, and a, and most research would tell you that if you're trying to get the most out of your team. At a minimum, you should be balanced, um, and most likely, you should be skewed positive. Mm -hmm. You know, you should be taking your your best athletes and reminding them to use their strengths to get even stronger, not to like obsess about the places they're most weak. Like, yes, you want it to not be a liability, but I'm not going to bring my right fielder in to pitch. You know what I mean? I'm going to have them work on hitting for power, which is why they're on the team, or whatever that you know, whatever the right analogy is. Um, so you sort of get into that world too, where um, you know, it, it skews negative, it's, 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 and it gets to the last thing, which is most times um, feedback says a lot more about the giver than the receiver. So you're bringing all of your experiences, all of your biases, all of your perspective to bear on this moment. And it, the goal of giving feedback is for the other person to get better, not for you to get something off your chest. Right. We're all pretty bad at actually knowing what's going to help somebody get better. And so that's where it also can get very tangled. And I don't know that like anonymizing that into a tool um, actually fueled that outcome in the way you'd want. And so I think that's like, those would be pieces where even as I now like teach cohorts and we, we have an entire module on feedback because this is such a big deal and so hard for people. And I think Ray was hundred percent right to try to like focus on this in the system because most companies are bad at it. Um, I don't think it's fully cracked. Like it's a really hard thing to do. And I don't, and simply having a tool didn't magically make it hum. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, it, I so it's like the theory and the direction, like you're directionally correct in terms of the approach and the <laughs> implementation maybe, or is it, it's not um, set in stone as to, as to how that gets implemented, but the idea that we create better feedback systems um, and, and probably the timing and the, of them and the observations probably matter to some degree. Um, it's certainly better than the old performance management system right. of what'd you do the last two weeks. That's the only thing I can remember. Like this, at least you had like a record, you know, of the whole year. Um, 
but again, I think there's just part of, it's sort of dependent on like, how much did you want to push people to put fuel into that system or how much did you want to let it be organic? You know, and it's like any tool, right? Like you, you roll out an app. Are you going to, is it going to be uptaken because it's so cool? Or are you going to like mandate it um, with compliance kind of protocols? Like it's a pretty, it's a pretty tricky thing to sort of like really find the balance on. Of all the, of all the tools approaches uh, for this, what, what do you think had like the most positive impact on either, you know, people's growth or the organization's decision-making as a whole, H however you want to take that. I'm just like the 80, 20 of it, I guess. Like where, where was the most bang for the buck you think? It's a good question. I, um, I'm like debating because I'm like, on one hand, I want my answer to be the principles. Like that idea, at least for me, you know, going from a world of sort of, I, I was pretty, like I said, we have an engineering degree, I'm pretty analytical, et cetera. But this idea of sort of breaking things down into like their fundamental truths. And you start to see a lot now written about like first principles thinking, right? That's how right. Elon, you know, right. did SpaceX and Tesla, et cetera. Um, so that's like my first instinct, um, you know, but one that might surprise you was we recorded all of our meetings. Mm. Um, like, so literally the, you know, every room was, was set up with a recorder. You could just sort of walk in and press a button. Um, and who knows, it might be involved now where you just walk in and your badge makes it start. Uh, but literally everything was recorded. And I remember, this was one of the, probably like the biggest delta between what I expected and the benefit. So I, it was the one I was most like, I'm going on a reality TV show. Like this is literally being on Big Brother. Every single thing is recorded. Um, it was the one I remember spending the most time debating. Like, do I really want to live like that? And then, you know, flash forward six months and it totally, I had a totally different perspective on it. Like I, again, I'm not sure I could handle the logistics of it for a small company, but the benefits of it in terms of, you know, there was no more people talking behind each other's backs because it was on tape. You know uh -huh. what I mean? So it was sort of like, um, be, and that, that somehow just then made you much more willing to be like, Mike, this is how I'm seeing things. Let's hash it out instead of going to like a third party and whinging about it. And then someone else is crying in your office. And then just things I had experienced other places were sort of eradicated from the system in certain ways. Um, the idea that you could go back to the tape, you know, so many times you'd have people come in your office and like, we disagree on this thing. And you're like, well, you said this and you said this. And you're like, we can literally just go see what you said. Like, not that hard. Um, and it's just little things like that. So I'd say that was the one that surprised me most on the upside based on where I was walking in the door. Interesting. So if, if you had to, um, I guess, I'm trying to think of like how you take the idea of, of feedback and, and of, I guess, resolving disputes uh, fairly, it, it, you know, that, that makes me think of what you said with the, with the recordings. Um, are there like, how, how do you, I guess, get the, get him, so let's take it outside of Bridgewater. Sure. How do you maybe coach people to want more feedback and more truthful feedback and, and kind of accept that? Like, I, I see, I see the, I see the approach at Bridgewater. I'm like, that's great because we're get we're trying to get to a truth you got to kind of buck up, you got to kind of have a thick skin and you got to sort of want to, to, to go down this process of getting better and of hearing all these perspectives and maybe not emotionally getting too tied up emotionally. Like, how, how do you maybe outside of Bridgewater, how, how do you coach uh, somebody on that? Are, are, these, are these tools still applicable or are there just other approaches? Um, I think the, I would almost like set the, the literal apps aside. They might be right for some companies. Like right. I think Coinbase just signed up for the doc collector. So that, you know, that's, that's a publicly available commercial application that might right. work for the right size and right interesting company. But I think the principles and the concepts can apply more broadly. And um, let's just take a couple that I think you were highlighting. So one might be, how do you get people to go from sort of fearing receiving feedback yeah. to hungering to receive feedback? Yeah. You know, the reason I think it worked is, you know, first you have to build that kind of growth and like um, kind of learning mindset into the organization that so you have to say, like, we prioritize this um, and you have to show it, right? You have to show that like, yep, we're going to experiment. We're going to make mistakes. 
And then we're going to learn from it and we're going to make better experiments and make more mistakes and then learn from those. And we're going to compound and grow. Like you could literally see that everywhere in Bridgewater and not just, so it wasn't just like a piece of paper telling you to do it, but then you could see people doing it. So that's showing and telling lining up. So I'd say if I was a, a founder or a small team running a small team, and I wanted this to be true, I'd first have to like, make sure I am like showing it on a regular basis. The next way I would show it is like, I would be vulnerable. I would be seeking feedback. Yes. I would be role modeling. Um, you know, like it's mostly like do what you want them to do first and then they'll do it. And so it's like, you need to, as the leader, be the one in it, making that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Another thing I would be doing is, is sort of getting people. So if you have this like learning culture and then you have a leader who's doing it, then I think you need to, um, you basically need to get people away from good and bad. Like this is where I find the hardest thing is people think of it as like positive feedback and negative feedback, or they use, if you listen to people, like I do this a lot when I interview, you kind of listen to the language they use about giving feedback or receiving feedback. And it's really charged. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you're going to hit people with feedback, you know, you know, punch them in the face, you know, like they crushed me with that feedback. It's just like all, it's all loaded mm -hmm. versus if you just sort of take more of like a scientist approach and it's just like, everything's generating data. The data is, you know, hopefully the data is accurate and the accurate is going to tell you it worked or it didn't work. And if it worked, keep doing more of it. And if it didn't work, change something and do something different. You know what I mean? And that almost like taking that like good, bad, like supercharged language out of your team's vocabulary and just into like true or not true, you know, did it work or not work? Um, that would be the other thing. And, you, and that just takes a lot of reps and repetition, you know? And then I guess the, the last one is hire the people who are into that. Like, this is a hard thing to train. If you are one of those people who takes um, criticism in that way, it's, a, it's one of the hardest things to loop out of. So that's why you'd see a lot of Bridgewater people had, some had military backgrounds, a lot of, a lot of sports and athletes because they were used to being coached. Like anybody who had been used to like looking back at failure and iterating on it tended to like actually find it refreshing. And people who hadn't grown up in that way, who'd only like maybe gone through academics and gotten A's the whole time, found it crushing. So I think you got to pick your right people too. Yeah, that makes sense. So the, the get, getting away from good and bad and getting towards truth on truth, that's, a, that's I think, one of the principles <laughs> in the book. Uh, so it, it's, it's an example that the, the organization, you know, the, the book isn't just marketing, like it's ingrained and, and you can learn a lot from that. And I think... As part of that, what you were alluding to was saying, kind of treating everything as an experiment. And I think you and I had a little bit of a Twitter exchange uh, recently on, on that topic, like because you're, you're putting out a lot of stuff on Twitter and I, and I just love it around management leadership. And, and I, I do think that that is one of the, the mindsets that's missing from uh, a lot of young employees is they're not treating it all as a process. A, a, you know, a, a big long set of, of rolls of the dice, every single decision you make, right? And, and, and looking at that in the long term. Um, and I think when you do that, when you flip, when your mind flips that switch, you're like, a lot of that emotion comes out of it. And you're, it takes a little bit of the blinders off and you can kind of say, okay, yeah, I screwed up on that big deal. Like we, I've got 500,000 more decisions to make in my life and, and kind of get on with it. So I do yeah. think that's, that's like a big um, piece of it. So I talked a little bit about Twitter. You're, you're not at Bridgewater anymore. You've kind of, you've kind of done a career pivot and we love career pivots here on this show. So I, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing, how that decision was made, you know, to, to leave this amazing company, this, you know, <laughs> huge, well-respected company and, and kind of go to your own thing. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So the, um, you know, I was coming up upon, I think 10 years, right. I'd been there about nine years. Uh, the way Bridgewater treated management is we were, um, pretty rotational by design, right? So I had been in five departments over those 10 years. Uh, I'd been the COO of two of the bigger departments. I had run a big department. That's kind of the department head. Uh, I was then working in recruiting, running executive recruiting, and, you know, that all sort of conspired around the same time as the pandemic. And so we went from being a company that really prized being in person, like all employees were, with the exception of maybe a couple dozen were in Westport, Connecticut. Um, and all of a sudden we were home, right? And we were home for much longer than we thought. And so, you know, 
the staff to run multiple buildings or the, the needs of kind of the, it was very clear that the world was changing in a way that the structure of the company was going to have to change. Um, you know, and so as we restructured it, it forced some reflection for me, you know, like the next logical step was going to be probably the COO of another big department. And, you know, is that, was that going to be sort of the thing you were just saying? I think of it as like collecting experiences, like in your career, you want to collect them and they can be good and they can be bad, but both of them are going to teach you something and prepare you. Like, even when you have failures and mistakes, you can often teach other people how to avoid them, or you can glean something important that will then help you avoid them in the future. And so was I really going to collect any new experiences, you know, running the operations for another department at a company I'd been at for 10 years. And my, my conclusion was mostly no, that like not, not material enough. Um, and so we got, you know, my wife and I sort of had a real conversation. We made some interesting choices. Like we, we had done a giant renovation on a house. You know, we had always wanted to do kind of a gut renovation. We had just finished basically a five-year project um, and thought, well, what if we sold this, kind of got our money back out of it? Um, we actually never thought we would because the housing market in Connecticut was only going to probably stay flat or go down. But then we all know what happened in the housing market the last two years. So we sold in the you know, June of the pandemic. We moved back to a smaller house. We sort of re, you know, that got us a mortgage at much lower rates. So we like really trimmed our costs down. And we spent, we made a lot of decisions like that to sort of extend the runway. Um, and then we bought a, you know, I left Bridgewater. We, we said like, let's give it a year. If I can find a business to buy, that'd be great. Um, if not, then I'll, you know, we'll reconsider whether this is the path and we'll go find something else. And so we found one in four months. Um, it was an online education review site that we bought from a, a fellow in Australia. And that was really meant to like, okay, now I can have cash flow. You know, it's not like, a, um, we had a few thesis on how we'd grow at and we'll get to that in a second. But, you know, that after kicking the tires on, you know, 40 or 50 businesses, it seemed like the right one that I could operate pretty independently, that would give us plenty of cash flow for a while, um, and that had some growth opportunities. So that that happened, and then from there, serendipity took over. How so? <laughs> um, well, one of the thesis on this site was there was this emerging type of course called cohort-based courses. So if you've seen either Maven or Reforge or On Deck, it's sort of running live cohorts of people getting trained on the same topic at the same time. Um, they tend to be much higher price points than like a Udemy or a Skillshare or a LinkedIn learning. Uh, but they also tend to come with like the benefit of a community. Like you, you, sh you might be interested in online writing. You're now with 60 other online writers, all aspiring, cheering each other on, sharing notes. Um, so you kind of feel like come for the class, but leave with a community. Mm -hmm. And so we, the part of the thesis was, well, we can start to review these sites. Like there'll be this, no one's doing this yet. We'll do that. Um, and so in order to do that, we'll take a class. And the class I picked was Sawhill Bloom's Twitter audience building course. And part of that was because my entire business was premised on Google and Google had just changed the algorithm and my traffic went down 15%. It kind of bounced back in a couple of weeks, luckily, but it was still like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like I'm pretty concentrated. And so I went in there to build our company's Twitter hand, like our Twitter account. And I couldn't have been three minutes into the course where he's like, if you're here to build a brand Twitter account, you're wasting your time. That's really hard to do. <laughs> and I was like, well... Well, shit. <laughs> um, he's like, but you, you know, any anybody in here can build a personal Twitter account. You have to find like find your lane and write about it, et cetera. And so I started writing about um, a bunch of different things like online education, leadership management, and then um, a couple of those took off. Made friends with the folks at Maven, got into their accelerator, uh, and um, sort of in the process of figuring out that course, found this community of kind of zero to ten year. Uh, managers and leaders who weren't getting any support, who, you know, a lot of companies were thinking of it as congratulations, you've made it to the top and now you're on your own. Um, and when they asked for help, they sort of got the like management by hazing response of like, well, I figured it out, you'll figure it out too. And, um, you know, based on what I had seen at Bridgewater through all of our efforts to like train managers and systemize, like there are some basic things you can teach people. Like you can teach them how to delegate. You can teach them how to give good feedback. You can teach them how to, um, empower people to do their work and be far enough to not be micromanaging, but close enough to support. You can teach them how to size people up differently and realize that not everybody on their team is the same. And so um, we put together a course to do that. And that's what, that's the part where serendipity took over. Like we've done two really successful cohorts. Um, you know, the last one, you know, we, we had almost all nines and tens and people said, 
you know, it was worth 10 X the value they paid. Um, tomorrow I wrap up a uh, cohort with on deck that where we did, we trained 28 of their managers. Um, we're, I think we're about to start another one with another company next week. And so my, my supplemental business has become the primary business, yeah, um, yeah. which has been pretty, pretty wild journey the last you know, four months. So what's super interesting to me is the, this part about how, you know, as I was, as I was researching the, the, I was looking at the course and researching you a little bit. Um, you, you have people from Amazon and, and some large companies that you would think yeah. have pretty darn good management training programs, if not for the sole purpose of just attracting people. Um, but there's something lacking. It, it seems like, I mean, I, and you're in a great position to, to help with that. What, what do you think is lacking in, in most uh, management training courses or management training programs, I guess, at, at companies? So the two things that I've heard most consistently, because um, you're right, I, we have, it's a really big mix. Like we've had people from five continents. We've had like large, large corporations where to your point, you think they'd be super well um, yeah. trained and reimbursed. And then we've had, my last cohort had nine founders. Um, so it's also, um, it's also people who, in many cases, they're sort of stepping into management for the first time, even though title-wise, they might look very senior. You know, a lot of founders had a great idea. They might have a couple partners. Then they get like a seed or a series A, and now they have a team of 15. And they're like, well, wait, I was the, I was the product thought person, not the leader of humans. Um, so how do I do this? But the, the two things that I've heard most consistently, so one is um, one is that the majority of training comes from career trainers and, and like facilitators. Mm -hmm. and so a lot of time the training sort of comes off of, I have this question and the response is, well, what do you think? Um, versus, you know, the, 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 a lot of what's come back in the comments for us is like, what I love is that you've done this for 20 years. Like you've managed teams of two and teams of 200. You've managed everyone in the same office and people in four different countries. And so that idea, if I can just sort of, at least I can trade war stories, you know, I can sort of like, well, this is what worked for me when I ran into that same thing. Or, you know, when I had this toxic employee, here's the three mistakes I made, don't do that. Um, and things of that nature. So that's one. And then the other one is there's something in a lot of organizations about like, well, what is your support structure? Like it can be very lonely. They call it, you know, they say like it's lonely at the top. It's also just lonely leading anything. Um, cause you may, for whatever reason, depending on your organization, you may not feel super comfortable or have access to your peers. You may not want to take everything to your boss. You probably don't want to like be chewing the ear of your team in some cases. And so to find this community of other people who are, you know, probably in non-competitive companies, similar organizations, or even very different organizations, but sort of on the same lonely journey as you are, a lot of people just said they got a tremendous value from having those like small intimate connections of people they can now call after the fact or people they could just, you know, we do breakout sessions for 20 minutes and they would just, you know, we'd have three founders or, you know, three managers just riffing on a problem. And they, they said that they, even that was great. They didn't even need me in the room for some of that stuff. So I think those are the two things that um, a lot of kind of traditional corporate training doesn't give people. So what, what's like maybe the one to three big takeaways, uh, that somebody's going to come out of your course with? Um, I would say the one that I think surprises people is like the absolute um, foundational importance of being self-aware mm -hmm. of like developing that a really keen understanding of what you're like, where your strengths lie, where your mindset or your biases might help you or hurt you. Um, you know, the skills that you might have, how you might use others to supplement them, et cetera. So just like developing that, um, developing that self-awareness not only helps you sort of put yourself on the field where you belong or don't belong, it also gives you a language and an appreciation for the differences of everybody else. And so we actually start the course there. And it's, it's one where um, pretty consistently everyone has said like, of all the things on the curriculum, that one didn't seem like it was going to be very interesting. And then at the end, the, it gets one of the highest ratings where they're just like, oh, that was actually really important. So um, that's one. I think coaching and development, like not a lot of organizations, um, people will often go to feedback and sort of the like, how do I give negative feedback? But instead, what we're really talking about is like, how do you develop your people, right? The, the real goal is to take someone who's a B and turn them into an A or take an A you know, and like get them to be twice as impactful or strip bad work off of them so they can like focus on where they're super powered. 
And it's like, how do you do that as an individual? And how do you bring that together as a team? And how do you, what is the difference between like coaching and directing? And so I think that's usually one that people have found um, really like lifts their teams and that they can do. And then I would say the one that everyone comes for um, is, is delegation. That like setting really clear expectations with people, not just on like what the work should be, like, oh, your sales quota is a you know, $10 million, but how? You know, like what process do we use? What technology? What are our corporate cultural standards? What are the behaviors we want our team to embody with customers and things of that nature? And then doing that so that now delegation is, is just like, okay, we've agreed on this expectation. Now deviations are just us collectively as partners comparing the difference of whatever happens to what we said was going to happen. Um, and sort of, sort of, it moves delegation from like the old model, you know, the old Eisenhower matrix of like, you know, delegate the crap to, you know, how do I empower you to do more on behalf of this team? Because you're the best person to do it. And it's the best thing for your growth. Um, so I think those are probably the three. I've also heard that we're one of the only trainings that do, um, we have an entire recruiting module. So apparently a lot of people keep that separate. So, um, okay. and we did a lot of recruiting at Bridgewater. So I have a, have a few reps on those. Cool. I know we're up again, kind of up against time. I do have a couple more, like two more questions. I feel free to keep your, uh, answers brief if you, if you need to, otherwise I'm here. So I, you know, we can keep going, but uh, you made this career change. What was kind of like, what, what do you think the keys to making a career change like you did are, or, you know, you can take it as like maybe something that you learned from doing it. Yeah, I think one I alluded to was like, for me, at least, like I needed to have a really clear understanding of my finances to know like how long was long was I could be fine for. And it was both important for me, but for my wife, for my family, for all of us to be on the same page. And so it, it was a pretty thorough scrub of like, what are our finances? What are our plans A's and B's? You know, where can we cut down big expenses, et cetera. So that just having that actually gave me a lot more um, confidence and understanding. And then I think, you know, we're 18 months into it. So take it for what it's worth. Um, I would say like, taking action, but listening for the response has been huge. So again, I talked about having a business for 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, I finally took action and it was nerve wracking and it was a little bit like a step into the breach. And then, like I said, serendipity intervened. And I think it was actually good that I didn't just like buy this business and like put blinders on and not listen to the fact that like, oh, I do need to kind of diversify my traffic. And like, oh, that did open up this new concept of training. And oh, wait, I actually can really like not, you know, get great engagement from people on this thing. And oh, wait, that's actually now the bigger business. And so that idea of, I never would have done that if I hadn't taken action. Um, and I also probably wouldn't have done it if I hadn't taken a lot of the problem solving tools I had gotten from Bridgewater and applied them of like looking at the data, iterating and iterating through it. Excellent. Um, what, what advice would you give to you know, a young person right out of college, looking at their career, looking at starting their first job, um, just about being, being successful. I think if I were to take one of my mistakes and sort of go back and like, I would say um, this a job that's a seven or an eight out of happiness and fulfillment is the most dangerous one you can get into. Cause I think when you have a job, that's like a three, you know what I mean? Like you have that boss who's terrible and toxic or the company mission doesn't align or the company's good. Like it's such an easy choice to kind of move on and find something better. And when you're in the 10, the nine or the 10, you're like, it couldn't be better. I'm thriving. I'm, I'm, I'm collecting those experiences. I'm growing. I'm getting new challenges. I'm like psyched. And the seven or eights are like, they're tricky because they're the ones where you're like, it's okay. Like, you know, I'm, I'm super privileged. I'm lucky. I've got a good job. It's not a great job. Yeah. Um, I would be really wary of those. Like, I think you should force yourself um, within some reasonable time frame, call it three to six months, to force it to a nine or 10 or force it to a three or four and then choose, especially early on. Like I just, if I could go back, I probably would have gotten a few more pieces of data and allowed myself to iterate faster to the place I ultimately got to. That's great. I love that. You're totally right. That's very tricky. You, you start getting comfortable. You got a steady paycheck. Um, and you start putting up with things that maybe you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. um, they start giving you equity. So now you're built in more long-term. It, it, it gets super tricky fast. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Dave, this has been great. I found you on Twitter 
I love all the stuff you're doing on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, if to, to my audience, if you want to learn about leadership, if you want to learn about management, hiring, follow Dave. Um, I'm going to let you give out your handles and where anybody else can kind of find out more about you and your businesses. Yeah, I think you nailed the two best ones. Like I'm probably most active on Twitter. So decline I, I, uh, also David Klein on LinkedIn and, uh, we will, we're going to be launching the MGMT accelerator website shortly. Uh, and we'll probably have a new offering on there that will be a a little a slightly lower price point and not just a couple of times a year in the uh, accelerator. So stay tuned. Excellent. And we'll make sure we, you know, have links to all of that in our show notes page and we will uh, look forward to following you. Uh, I'm just so excited with all the stuff you put out. I love it. And um, just love following your journey. And I'm kind of right, kind of right behind you. Got the site, got the Google traffic and all of that and working on more of the community-based uh, model. So uh, I'm, lear I'm learning tons from you and I really appreciate it. Really, really appreciate all of your time and coming on today. Thanks for having me on. It's fun doing this journey together, Mike. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers.